Hello, everybody. This is Baron Baptiste. Welcome to Disrupt the Drift. Here is the place where we can tell the truth and the truth can be told. Please share the show. If you get something from the show, share the show. Send in your questions to Disrupting the Drift at BaronBaptiste.com. We post these on YouTube twice a week at Disrupt the Drift is the name of the channel on YouTube when you search it. Leave your comments, questions, concerns, your insights. Leave them in the comments on YouTube. We appreciate that. David, how you doing? Fantastic. Always better when I'm with you, brother. Yeah. So I've been thinking about something I want to talk through with you, and, and it's about living in the head, living in thoughts, because it's something I grapple with every day from the moment I wake up, have thoughts and the thoughts are right there and then go through the day and just, I notice, oh, wait, I'm in my head right now. <laughs> I'm in my thoughts, like, and just get present, Fe feel my feet on the floor and okay, I return to here. And I notice it's almost like they're one of two places to live in the head, in thoughts, uh, in imagination, in fantasy, just that world of imagination and thinking. And it's, there's nothing powerful about that. And I, there's something, I call it thoughting, just thoughting through the day, just thoughts. And thoughting and th just living in thoughts, living in the head, as it's not related to reality. I mean, think about what you're going to do, but that's not doing it. You can think about having a conversation with someone, but that's not having it. There's, and then the moment you come out of thoughts, there's a kind of freedom, and an instant peace, instant freedom. And a different kind of power to be related to life and reality and real people, real things, real situations like present and relating to reality. What do you see about this? Because let me just say this one last thing about it. What I see is it comes with when you live in your head, you have certain things, but you don't get to have other things. When you live in the head, you also open yourself up to different kinds of forces and spirits and energies when you live in the head. When you're not in the head, you open up to a wholly different kind of force, life forces and different energy. And so I wanted to have a conversation around distinguishing what is it to live in the head? Because I know most everybody, people in life default, people live in their heads, they live in their imaginations, they're not present. And they don't know it. They're not present to not being present because they live in their heads. Now, they may think about being present, but that's not being present. <laughs> what do you see? The question that arises immediately is, are you being directed by your thoughts or are you directing your thoughts? Because I don't even actually think it's possible to be in a place that there aren't thoughts present. In other words... You can't just block thoughts. It's, it would be like pinching off your, your main heartbeat. artery. Yeah, because yeah. You, you it's just, like you stopping know. your heartbeat. Right. You, you, the mind. Yeah. The brain. Whatever the source. It, there's just thinking is thoughting is there. Yes. But there is a space that's thought free. And what I heard you just say is you didn't say it quite like this, but what I got from it is. There's thoughting, there's just having thoughts, living in thoughts, living in imagination. And then there's thinking, where you're doing actual thinking through something. Mm -hmm. You're trying to figure something out or sort through something. You're doing thinking, creative thinking, or you're problem solving thinking. Different than just living in exactly. thoughts, just yeah, random exactly. thoughts, yeah. the stream of thoughts that are ever present. In this place where we are attempting to be free from the influence of our thoughts, first of all, we have to notice what the source of those thoughts actually is. And I ask the question, are you directing your thoughts or are you being directed by your thoughts? Now, and then the other question is, mm. are they really your thoughts? Because I used to wonder, I, I would see a thought flit through my mind and I would notice that, where did that thought come from? And then the next question would be, why is that thought there? And then the next question would be, is that really my thought? Because, see, I don't think that we ourselves are original generators of thought, period, unless 
when you say to somebody, if somebody asks you a question and you don't know the answer right away, you say, let me think about that. What it means is you want to take time to contemplate it. And contemplating is a different issue around thought than thought itself, because thought is constantly being piped into you from some source, usually on the outside. And so contemplation causes you to step back. Contemplation is actually a form, a lesser form of meditation. And let me read to you what Sam Harris, the physicist, said. The habit of spending nearly every waking moment lost in thought leaves us at the mercy of whatever our thoughts happen to be. Now, that's a great thought right there in and of itself. We, we don't think about our thoughts. We, as a matter of fact, sometimes people get lonely and they feel empty when they don't have those thoughts there because they're so unaccustomed to not being occupied with thinking. And I have somebody uh, in my family who is an obsessive thinker, thinking, thinking all the time, figuring things out. And what that's I see most about people, that- though. I think that's most people. It is, but what I see about that is that what they are actually trying to do is to avoid the void. <laughs> because where real authentic contemplation and then authentic insights come from is from the void. It doesn't deeper come thinking, from the, a deeper yeah. kind of bigger yeah. kind of thinking. Yeah. So I think they're but, avoiding yeah. the void. They don't like the feeling of emptiness. And so if there isn't a problem, people will invent one. And how many people conjure issues and things to occupy themselves with as a means of, it's almost like a pacifier. And here's what the pacification is all about. We know that we're running out of time, that we are finite beings, that we only have so much time in this life. This is the back of mind thinking that most people never want to grapple with, but it's the truth. All of our time is limited. If you could see the number counter above your head, the invisible number counter, the numbers are going down from the time you're born. It's not the amount of time you have that's going up. It's actually diminishing from the time you come into this world. And you don't know how long you have. None you of us do. You don't know how long you have. None so of us do. There's yeah. an anxiety attached to this idea that we only have so much time and that what we really have to do is find the meaning of our lives. That's what we're yeah, here it's, for. It's interesting, yeah, because if you look at people who have this kind of, I call it a life sentence of oh. like a judge, a judge gives you a sentence Yes, and it's a life sentence that you pick up somewhere along the way of you're not enough. You're yeah. not worthy or you're wor worthless or you're no good. You, know, you have these kind of fundamental core, what are they like points of view or something. And if you, if your thoughts are being sourced from I'm worthless, I'm no good. And maybe you don't know that, but then those, the kind of thoughts like a spring water coming up out of the earth, a natural like spring, it's just like bubbling up. If what's at the source of the ground of your being is I'm not worthy. I'm no good. I'm stupid. I'm not enough of something, not enough of anything, not smart enough, not pretty enough, not, not enough. It's this, the source of this wellspring of thinking, thoughts. It's, I remember one time, just years ago, but I, I got really present to the voice in my head. I had this thought of, I just overate. I ate a, a meal and I just, I, I was full, but I kept eating kind of thing. And then I ate the whole plate and I was like, why did I eat all that? And right there, the voice was like, because you're a fat pig. It was like right there. I'm like, where did that come from? It was a voice. But I think we all have that, this voice in the background that, that is giving a commentary about ourselves, about others, about everything, about life. And that voice in the head is a liar in there. It's a deceiver. And it's a voice of doubt. But where does that come from? So it may be in some fundamental point of view we have about ourselves or about life. But then there's also, you could hear a hundred people speak and they're all dealing with the same kind of voice in the head and this whole thing, the, the same kind of, I'm not worthy. I'm not enough. I'm no good. I'm invisible. I'm not seen. I'm like this similar, but to me, there's some kind of collective, there's a collective voice in default humanity yeah. until you come back to truth, until you come back to 
creator and conscience mm. that that speaks to us in a language, a common language. It doesn't matter. I've taught all over the world. It doesn't matter if you're if you speak Chinese or you speak Spanish or you speak Korean or doesn't matter in language. Africa, all the different languages. It's a default in all humanity, regardless of language or what language you speak. And there, so there's something in the collective default human beings in a fallen state that we're subject to, but it, it comes through some invisible veil. So I can yeah. identify what you're saying. And let's just take three components of this. And he, here's what Will Durant said. The trouble with most people is that they think with their hopes or fears or wishes rather than with their mind. I hope this doesn't happen. Oh my gosh, what if this happens? Or I really wish this would happen. You see how most people are in default mode all the time in one of those three components, hope, fear, or wishing. And, well, and, and I'll add a, a should. I should be this way. They should be that way. Yeah, it, exactly. Life yeah. should be this or it should not be. Yeah. I shouldn't be this way. They shouldn't be this way. Right. Life shouldn't be that way. But it's then always, the question goes yeah. to where are these hopes, fears, and wishes produced? Yeah, where are they coming from? What's now, the source? Yeah. Part of it is the subconscious, which is what Freud called the id, the subconscious self, the ego. And, but, and the ego is full of hope, fear, and wishes because the ego itself is insecure. Everybody who, has, who lives from their ego is insecure. And if you ever notice the squirrels in the park, they're always looking around. They're always watching their back. Because they live in a world full of other people whose egos potentially are a threat to them. Other people or other animals? Other people. But I'm using the example of the squirrel in the park. We are always feeling the air. We're always oh, sniffing. Like pe people are like the squirrels. <laughs> yeah, people are like the they're squirrels and they're for... constantly looking because yeah. they know that they're vulnerable. That everybody, everybody knows they're vulnerable. And those it's gotta who, be primitive, like the reptilian brain kind of I think goes way back level, of yes, back yes. in the days, right? Yeah, we yeah. as human beings were always we're on survival. It was a matter yeah. of is there a saber toothed tiger coming around the block or the local tribe is gonna come and take us out, or it, it was a dangerous world all of the time. We still have that wiring. Yeah. Yeah. And the world and, is a dangerous place. Yeah. <laughs> So we can justify it. But when we're running on automatic like that, rather than dealing with situations as they arise, we're trapped. So the ego then, so it goes back to the original question I asked, are you being directed by your thoughts or are you directing those thoughts? And, and again, here you are sitting in front of your TV, you've got 250 channels available to you. And you're scanning those channels. You're moving from one channel to the next. Nope, nope. Oh, what's that? Most people don't do that with their thoughts, with the thoughts that are there. They aren't even their thoughts. You don't have thoughts. Thoughts have you. But if you had a channel changer in your hand, that would change the dynamic because then you're in charge of what it is that you're stopping and pausing on or what you're bypassing. You see my point? Most people yeah. are so unaware that they are constantly being directed by those thoughts, and those thoughts are coming from prompts on the outside. And again, we go back to social media for a moment. What are they called? Oh, yeah, they're called influencers. And so when a person is involved with an influencer, where are they getting their thoughts? Oh, they're getting it from that influencer. And if it isn't from the influencer, who's your group of friends that you hang around with? Those are your influencers. And if you're not getting from them, what about your family? What about your significant other? Where yeah, are we, these thoughts coming from? And where are the thoughts coming from to them into you? Yeah, we adopt. Oh, we adopt yeah. A lot of adopting. Thoughts. We adopt yeah. stories. Yeah. We adopt viewpoints. And so Jung said, talked about the collective consciousness, right? Where Freud was talking about the ego in, within the person and then Jung may have spoken to that too, I don't know, but he also spoke about the collective conscious. There's something that we're subject to in the collective. And if you don't have yourself and you don't know yourself and the, realiza powerful, the powerful realization of 
I am not my thoughts. I have thoughts, but I'm not my thoughts. When I don't have that, when I don't have that distinction, then what I have is just thoughts. And I buy into my thoughts. I don't have that remote you're talking about, the ability to change the channel. That's where meditation is a powerful tool. You get quiet, you get still, you stop, you drop in, you get present, and you wake, you fall awake. And what something you wake up to is, okay, I have thoughts. I'm not my thoughts. There's something else within me that can watch thoughts. So I must be at least a step closer, whatever it is in me that's able to observe thoughts is probably closer to my essential self in the same way with emotions, right? You can have emotions and then do they have you or do you have them? You, you can again realize I have emotions. I'm not my emotions. I have them just like I have my hand, but I'm not my hand. I have a hand, <laughs> but I'm not my hand there you go. or my body, but I have a body. Uh, can I observe my body? Y yes. And what's observing is closer to who I am. And case in point, you walk into a dark house, the, the lights are off, and all of a sudden you get this little chill up the back of your neck. You feel like somebody's behind you. And then you run for the light switch and you turn on the light and you realize you're alone. But until the light comes on, you have this creepy suspicion that you're, you, something is there. But the question then goes to, is it cause or effect? And so we have to look at our lives in the same way that we might sense that we, when we walk into a dark hallway that something isn't, doesn't feel right. But when we turn on the light reveals to us that it was whatever it was a notion or it was a little bit of fear or it was a suspicion that we had for whatever reason. And then we begin to get to look at why that was there. If we want to, if we don't, okay, there was nothing there. But that's having that switch. You talk about meditation, but really what it boils down to is that when you begin to observe something, you separate from the subjectivity to it. And the, the, the second you realize that you're reacting to that dark hallway, you know what the answer is. Flip on that switch and turn on the light. What occurs to you is an answer, right? But, it, but let's say you're in a place you've never been before and you don't know where the hallway light is. Do you panic? Do you lose your mind? Do you lose control? Do you give in to the fear? Do you allow it to consume you? Some people do. But well, we do until we don't. We do until we don't. Yeah. <laughs> until we know we have some kind of say in our experience or how things go. Or better said maybe is how will I experience? I, I have say in how I will experience what I'm experiencing. So we have in our lives, we have billions of experiences. We have just billion, every moment of every day we're having experiences. And then some experiences get highlighted. Some experiences stand out if something happens or we're confronted by something or we're threatened by something. Those experiences stand out and those experiences can stick around if we had enough fear, if we had uh, fearful uh, enough or we were reactive enough yeah. toward an experience. And then those ones stand out. Those experiences stick out and maybe stick around like in a memory, uh, as a trauma or as a something. And though, is it possible to go through experience, but not have experience go through you, so to speak, where it grabs you, holds you captive? Is there a way to flow from the inside out with experiences? You're experiencing the experiences but you're not stopped by them or altered by them or sidetracked or thwarted mm. by them. Wayne yeah. Dyer, who is a beloved. Oh yeah, author. I know Wayne. I used to hang out with him from time to time. I, I used to hang out. Yeah, he passed I know away Wayne. a few years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A brilliant writer and a great philosopher. Here's what he says about it. 
you can either be a hostage to God or a mm. hostage to your ego. It's your yeah, call. A, a host <laughs> to what is it's a host a to host God. to God. A host a to God or a hostage to your ego. To your ego. That's yeah. good. I, I know that quote. Yeah, yeah. I haven't heard it in years. Yeah. I remember I used to quote that one from time to time. But you know what? I wouldn't mind being a that hostage says a lot. to God. I wish I could be captured. And you and I were actually talking about Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10.5. Yeah, earlier the, in the Bible, that quote is yeah. very good. Here's what, what it, it says. take all thoughts captive or something? Yeah. It says, we tear down arguments and every presumption set up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ, which is, again, if you – so, again, let's talk about the idea of an overlord. If fear is our overlord, then fear rules us. Yeah. But if we have a, a benevolent overlord, a, 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 a good overlord, someone who cares about us, a being that loves us and, and understands us, then when we bring those thoughts into the light and make it obedient to our overlord, again, we don't have thoughts. But what we do is we take away the power of thoughts to have us. By learning how to live in the moment, by being objective, by observing, and I have a, a saying that I've said many times, detect it and deflect it. There's power right there. So if, and sometimes I will actually have that moment where I'm in that dark hallway, and I'll feel that creepy sense coming over me, but my higher self is able to override that, and I allow myself to feel that fear and then let it pass. Because I know that there's nothing there. See, there's a power in knowing. There's a great power in knowing that you don't even have to react to something that is not there. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Awareness. Yes. Right? It's awareness. Yeah. Awareness. Yeah. Cultivating awareness, developing and expanding awareness of when you're uh, living in thoughts. But thoughts are liars. It's important to remember that. And thoughts lie all the time. <laughs> Was it from the four agreements of Don Miguel Ruiz, I think. Mm -hmm. In that four agreements, he has some something he says about the lie. He talks about the liar in the head and the liar in everyone else's head. And he talks about don't believe the liar in your head. Don't believe that liar in your head. And because you have a liar in your head, you can rest assured, I'm paraphrasing, but you can rest assured that others have a liar in their head. So he goes on to say, so don't believe anything you say and don't believe anything others say because there are <laughs> most people are talking from the liar in the head. It's interesting. If you stop believing in the liar in your head, stop believing in That's all it. those thoughts in your head. And stop believing, just being gullible on what everyone else is saying and buying into whatever everyone else is saying because other people lie just as you lie until you wake up to the truth. And that's a, I say that from ta I, almost presenting it as a challenge. What if you were to live by truth, of the truth, from the truth, just even for the next 30 days? What if you were to commit to just living of the truth, from the truth, by the truth? Just tell the truth. Be honest. Really, though, actually, for 30 days, wow, what would happen in your life? And what would happen? What would you start to see? And what would you can trust that people around you would become more obvious to you? And if you start telling the truth, maybe some of the people around you Suddenly wouldn't be so happy with you <laughs> if you were a truth teller. <laughs> yeah, because people yeah. lie all of the time and they don't know it because it's so, become so automatic to just go along and get look good and get approval and say the right things to not ruffle any feathers. You're calculating, you're cunning, you're always assessing and managing per people's perceptions. But what if you just told the truth? Wow. Well, I don't Actually, think it's as though. easy as you, you might think. It no, reminds me of it, the, the movie Nothing. Liar with Jim Carrey, yeah. where he, he can't tell a lie, and so he's in all kinds of trouble. Remember that movie? all snagged up. Because he was a lawyer, up. and his son made a wish that he couldn't lie <laughs> That's anymore. That's right. So. Yeah. 
It's like, yeah. it's not that his whole easy. Life, his whole world changed. It totally transformed. The world but changed. It, yeah. But he had to go through hell first. Yeah. Uh, and, and so anyway, I'm thinking of Dwayne Johnson. I saw an article today that said he regrets voting uh, for Biden. That's just an aside. So he restored a little bit of respect for him on my part. He says, check your ego at the door. The ego can be the great success inhibitor. It can mm. kill opportunities and it can kill success. Is that The Rock? Yeah, that's Dwayne The Rock that's, Johnson. That's The Rock guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. interesting. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Really good. So let's wrap this up. But I say two things come to mind. Meditation is a powerful tool to get present. Start awakening. Awakening. Start awakening. Awakening uh, a new kind of awareness moment to moment and very simple watch your notice when you're in your head in your thoughts from the moment you wake up notice you indulge and it's not that it's wrong or bad but it just gets you more of the same if you're someone who's committed to growing and waking up and discovering who you really are and who you could and can be shakespeare said you know who you are so you keep indulging thoughts and consuming others thoughts and okay but that gets you more of the same and so the challenge is get quiet get still and start watching the other thing i'll, I'll say is with something with i got to with yoga practice yoga practice when you go through these series of poses and i would do a s same similar kind of sequence of yoga poses physically get on the mat and move and breathe and it, it becomes very monotonous it's a like routine but what it where it became not monotonous for me and became alive, a living kind of way of moving was just the practice of being present. So I'd put my eyes on a point. I'd like physically every breath that would come in, every breath that would go out, my body, I'd be present. Practice became being present with every physical movement, every d moment of every movement. And, but we could take that off the mat, so to speak, into life because you're always moving every movement like right now you're sitting or right now you're walking whatever you're doing is a pr the it's a the potential of a practice of presencing yourself a physical presencing a waking up to the present when you wake up to the present you have an opportunity to get present to a greater presence the presence of a force, a higher power, your creator. And when we get present to a greater presence, what I notice is I get present to a greater presence within myself, my conscience, my inner knowing. Any last words, David? Detect and deflect because you don't have thoughts, although you do occasionally have amazing thoughts. When you can get everybody else's thoughts out of the way, where you can put up a, a sort of retaining wall against the outside world influences, what will happen is your own sense of things will begin to occur to you in a way that is so strong and so awakening and so liberating. Yeah. But until you are willing to annihilate your relationship with those other influences, you're suffocating your own voice. You're suffocating your own mind with other people's yeah breath and their thoughts and all their yeah. nonsense so yeah very good very good all right you all thank you peace out stay bold keep disrupting the drift keep aiming true until next time peace be with you 